initialize dampeners. Cut into feed. Begin transmission. This program is intended for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Late Night on Weird Fantastic Toy Adventures. I am Bill, and tonight's show is going to be Dick Tracy Spotlight. I cannot wait. So, without further ado, let's bring in uh, my co-host, Joneser, and we'll play him in real quick, and then we'll get Johnny Sorensen in here. What's up, everybody? It's Joneser, your favorite comic book guy. So let's do this. What's up? What's going on, Joneser, man? Good to see you tonight, man. Good to be here. Man, I'm going to bring Johnny on in, and then we'll all just get to chatting here. Hey guys, how you doing? Johnny Sorens. Good to see you. Good to see you guys. Well, we got quite a show uh, in store, and uh, what I'm going to do is do uh, this here. That way, uh, the guys who are in charge of things can can get it started here. Uh, so we're going to do Dick Tracy tonight. Uh, it's something that, that that's been in the works for a while, and uh, I think I kind of had to crack the whip and uh, kind of midweek and say, "All right, guys, we've been promising this. It's time to get get to get to uh, the show on the road." So, Johnny worked overtime. Uh, I am just absolutely I did. amazed. I did two shows this week. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm swear. I I know you're doing your own shows now too, so. That, Some uh, weeks I'm actually three, but that was a limit. Like one point five or two in a week is the max I can cram in. Uh, I get it, man. But uh, he has he has worked over, over and beyond on these uh, slideshows. So uh, he's done an excellent job. Uh, real quick, guys, let me try to catch up with the chat real quick before we get started. So let me run up here and uh, well, it looked like Johnny, you showed up first, so. There you go. He says it's yeah, time. I'm watching to get my work. wrestling DVDs. That's when I'm on my phone and I'm clicking what new things are on for the day. And uh, Pop Actor Rick wants to see your dick, Joneser. Oh, boy. All right. Well, let me whip this out. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh that's the stuff. There you oh, go. Yeah. yeah, here we go. And yeah. uh, Mr. Eldor says, good evening there, Bill, sir. Well, good evening to you. It looks like Sir Clifton has in the house. Good to see you, Sir Clifton. And uh, moving on down here, uh, 
Johnny Sorensen says the chipmunk song is on. Was that you or me? Oh, that was your intro thing. Had that, like, I don't know, kind of synthy high pitched squealing thing, <laughs> whatever it was. Oh, really? Did my intro not sound good tonight? No, no, it's just that's a style of music. <laughs> it sounds fine. Just oh, that, yeah, well, uh, Mr. Eldor said that it sounded like time traveling through the 80s. And, and uh, he also says, Oh, my, Mr. Roboto. And, I know my internet connection has been shitty tonight. You guys let me know. Uh, it, it, it's kind of mm, odd. Uh, great. A couple of dicks. A trifecta of dicks. OBS in the house. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you there, Denise. And uh, Gojitron has showed up. He says he's watching this on his two-way wrist radio. Uh, watching the radio, I mean, uh, that, 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 that's a, that's a feat in and of itself right there, Gojitron. So that gets us caught up on the chat. Uh, so tell me guys, what do you want to start at? You want to get, get the slideshow on started or y'all want to chat a little bit more or what y'all want to do? We can chat some, uh, do, do you have a little video here to show us too at some point? Well, I've got an intro before we start the slideshows, gotcha. and I thought that between the slideshows, we got two slideshows. One is all on the movie because the movie kind of has a slideshow in and of itself. And between the slideshows, I've got uh, some retro commercials that are kind of appropriate for tonight's I'll theme. Stop brushing my teeth now. <laughs> uh, there you go. So uh, yeah, uh, if you're ready to get started, I'll go ahead and show the. Uh, the Dick Tracy intro that I made. Now, the Patreons and channel members, uh, y'all had uh, uh, a little bit of uh, early access to what this intro is going to look like, but I added a little bit to the beginning of it. I was, I was teasing that to Jones. He doesn't know what it is either. It ain't much, but I thought it was just enough. Tell me what you I think when you come back, Jones. Now, it's time for the thrilling adventures of Dick Tracy. And uh, that was a little piece of music. If you look in the description of uh, down at the very bottom of the description of this uh, uh, video tonight, this live stream tonight, you will see the person who did that and the link to their YouTube channel where they did it. Uh, it, it is a Dick Tracy inspired little theme. And I thought it was rather appropriate to put in with our intro. Dude, it sounded Dick Tracy. Dick Tracy-ish. <laughs> it, it, it was supposed to. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, OBS. And uh, uh, Pop Actor said he was early because you told him it was too late because he already saw Jones' dick earlier. So, oh, yeah. Hold on, I got another one. Oh, one scared of that. oh, check that out, folks. It is the movie novelization written by Max Allen Collins. 
that I understand is probably 10 times better than the movie, except for the ending. Correct. No, the, the book is pretty cool. We'll probably, I'll probably uh, get into that once we get into the movie part of this. We'll read along. Jones and, are on audio cassette. Yeah. And to answer, to answer OBS, yes, that was Archie at the beginning. There was a, a version of the Archie cartoon show in the 70s called the U.S. of Archie. And they, uh, the one of the themes of that was that they, they would show the comic strips as cartoons on there. And Dick Tracy was one of them that I think they also did Broomhilda and maybe a couple of others. I can't remember what those were. But I, I distinctly remember watching that when I was a kid. I don't remember anything in particular about it. However, in preparation for tonight, I did uh, today watch a few of those uh, uh, or snippets of them. I didn't get to watch all whole videos of them, but I watched a couple of them to try to get myself in the mood for it. Uh, this is going to be Johnny and Joneser show pretty much tonight. I'm going to sit down here and make comments and ask questions, but I'm not going to be gonna make some comments, Bill fully involved in this but uh since since i'm in charge of, of the slideshows here i'm going to move across to the next oh, slide awesome. here and uh go guys talk about chester gould i'm gonna make the screen bigger <laughs> oh well you can do that if you go down to the corner of your actual screen. yeah i got it i got it yeah there. Um, th this is probably like the most small text and we get bigger stuff so i've got this up nice and big so i'll read it off if you like and then we'll go that'd go, be fine go to go to so um dick tracy is a fictional detective created and if i mangle the name i'm not american so forgive me <laughs> character created by american cartoonist chester gould chester gould was born into a farming family and grew up in pawnee oklahoma he showed an early interest in drawing and began his career as a cartoonist for local newspapers. He shopped around to a lot of different uh, newspapers, making the rounds as a lot of cartoonists did back in the day before getting to Dick Tracy and having like regular ongoing work, painted signs, painted signs of barns, lettering, all kinds of things, you know, any kind of graft, any kind of job to keep you going while you shop around. In 1931, Gould created the iconic detective character, Dick Tracy for the Detroit Mirror newspaper, which was called Plain Clothes Tracy until they officially changed the name. The strip made its debut on October 4th, 1931, and quickly gained popularity for its unique characters, intricate plots, and memorable villains. Chester Gould introduced several groundbreaking innovations to the world of comic strips through Dick Tracy. He was among the first to regularly feature continuing storylines, not unlike a certain Popeye artist we were talking about. <laughs> Um, character development in comic strips setting a new standard for the medium. Gould's art style was characterized by bold, exaggerated characters, meticulous attention to detail, especially in the depiction of technology and futuristic crime finding gadgets. And also like Popeye, it was incredibly violent. <laughs> the early yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah, talking about actually, Popeye, yeah. Excuse me, Dave Jones. I was talking about Popeye earlier today. Uh, I asked a question to some some people in a chat that I was in whether Hulk or Popeye, the comic strip version, would win in a fight. And everybody <laughs> seemed to think the Hulk would win, but I was like, yeah, Popeye was virtually unkillable and he was super strong all the time. He didn't have to eat the spinach out of the can to become super strong. He was super strong all the time because spinach was his diet every day. And uh, like Fearless Fosdick, uh, who was a uh, uh, a parody of Dick Tracy. Uh, you could shoot Popeye and just, just a hole would appear where the bullet went through and he would keep right on yeah. fight. But go, go ahead, Jones. I'm sorry to talk over you, bro. Oh, you're, you're fine. I, I was just going to say, uh, I actually started reading this strip from the first strip in 31. And I have gotten all the way through to 35. I have read them all in order and I plan on going all the way till I can't afford the volumes anymore <laughs> you know but uh i would say the speaking to the violence of this um yeah it doesn't take long for it to get pretty graphic like uh the, these villains die horribly or even the heroes are mangled it's 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 gnarly absolutely uh and uh we've already got the chat going strong here uh uh, Sir Clifton says, Bug, Bug calling Dick Tracy, Bug calling Dick Tracy. Three knuckleheads are using your name as joke punchlines on YouTube. Dick Tracy, I'm on my way. Oh, Jesus. 
I've seen him knock out 12 guys in one punch, so we better watch out. <laughs> yeah, he could probably he could probably beat all of our old asses. I don't know. Johnny's a little younger than we are. He might be able to hold his own for a little while longer than me. I'll probably just be like – I've got the speed, but I don't have the body weight, so someone just grab me, be a hug, slam, but I've, I've got the quick hands. <laughs> All right, let's get to the next slide here and see what we got in store. Okay, started out with plain clothes, Tracy. Go, Jonesy. Oh, Dick Tracy first appeared in the comic strip on October 4th, 1931 in the Detroit Mirror Newsstand. Chester Gold, its creator, aimed to create a crime-fighting hero who relied on his wits and innovative gadgets to combat criminals. And I'm looking at that artwork, and that doesn't look like Dick Tracy. That looks a little more realistic than, than dick tracy ended up being it, it it got more stylized as it went on the the, the square jaw and the hook nose started to come out a little more pronounced later mm -hmm. and i don't believe this um this may not have seen the light of day this plain clothes tracy i'm not no, sure this, is, this was like a test test one yeah so this is like his this audition was like for his reprint yeah, like I think before they printed it, they changed the name, but this yeah. was like his how he got the job. This was his yeah. portfolio, or whatever. and it, it was also, um, he'd shopped around to a lot of newspapers doing what you'd call job of work, just all kinds of one off things here and there. He would have a file of stuff he'd kept on for one off gag strips to sell to a paper here, paper there, trying to get jobs. And he found that his his art style before this whatever he was doing i haven't seen it it's just based on the description from an old interview um that people weren't buying his stuff that much but another artist he saw that he really couldn't stand was selling really well to a particular newspaper where he was working he went and copied that guy's work in secret and substituted in some of his own that went out on a paper and instead of firing him, the next day they're like can you draw great start drawing more stuff because they didn't know he could draw that well he controlled better than the guy that was already supposed to be their professional cartoonist at the paper. Okay. So he did m mimic some other guys' styles along the way to developing his own. Hmm. Well, you know, and that's just kind of funny, you know, how uh, people get the ball rolling or how they mm. get started in something because he started out trying to do something else and then he found himself doing this. That happens all the time. All right, let's move on here, uh, Johnny. So Dick Tracy is a tough, no-nonsense detective known for a square jaw and distinctive yellow trench coat. He's often portrayed as a symbol of unwavering justice, justice and law enforcement. And this is some of the later, um, you know, print comics that were along at the same time as the ongoing newspaper strip, but it was some of the easiest way of getting a good dynamic cover image versus a very tiny, small black and white one. I couldn't get <laughs> a good enough image to put in <laughs> Sure. I, find it, I find it interesting that Harvey Comics did this. This is the same comic strip that did Casper the Friendly Ghost. Yeah, Harvey yeah, and I think one, some of the other um, old Tommy ones too, like companies did some Dick Tracy ones. And but but also we think of the old newspaper strips, black and white. Dick Tracy was a big um, weekend color, nearly full page at times. So he, he took up a lot of real estate even before getting into the color, you know, comics, which could be made by other artists and writers and such. Well, comic book guys, the question that I have to ask of you is, were these comics reprints of the uh, strip or were they stories in and of themselves separate from the strip? I, I don't know for sure. I was looking at some today, but I think a number of them are, are I would say, they're original because the formatting of the panels is quite different than the strip and they're right. longer. Links. It's a little bit of a mixed bag. I think they're kind of based off of the appearances from the original strip, but they're presented in a different way. Like mm -hmm. that scene there, I think, with Flat Top and uh, Tracy there in the corner, I don't think that happens in the original story. So they, they, they did it some other way. Mm. And there's a lot of cool um, ads and promotional stuff like, here's tips about your local police and cr stopping crime in your neighborhood and stuff like this. They should, do that. they should do that in the newspaper strip too with the crime stoppers little blurb mm -hmm. at the end well gould was very passionate about law and order and uh um he he'd probably be turning over in his grave seeing how we treat police nowadays or, yeah. or what what the um reputation of policing has gotten to you know he was a very law and order guy he was very pro-police and uh yeah 
And that's one of the reasons he made Tracy a detective or cop and not a private eye or gumshoe like the old Dashiell Hammett or the old um, Humphrey Bogart type films and that back in the 30s and 40s. That was kind of the popular genre or thing. He distinctly made him hit a cop and not a private eye because he because of those values. Let me uh, let me do this right here real quick, guys, because some people who, who have joined us may not know who everybody is so we'll do that right there real quick and i'm gonna move on to the next slide here and let you guys go at it i think it's joneser's turn uh the early dick tracy comic strips were known for their gritty hard-boiled crime stories i can attest to that um the character became popular quickly with readers fascinated by the rose gallery of villains he faced including the likes of flat top jones this is my grandfather and uh prune face <laughs> so that's nice to know that flat top jones was your grandfather <clears throat> it's been quite a bit uh, <laughs> the top of your head is a little more rounded i guess that, that comes from your mother's side absolutely yeah uh, so uh let me move on to the next slide here to keep the show moving along gadgetry go uh johnny Okay. One of Dick Tracy's defining features was his use of cutting-edge crime-solving technology, such as his two-way wrist radios, and in later years, as Gojitron knows, the two-way video communicators, not unlike Star Trek, which were well ahead of their time. Chief, we have uh, have the stretcher car come over to Broadway and Kent. Yeah, pronto, please on his two-way wrist radio, which became a two-way wrist TV, which became a two-way wrist computer, which I don't even know what it is now. It's probably got uh, a holographic projector. Apple Watch uh, now, and everybody's got one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really. Oh, and George Valentine just showed up in the chat. Hey, man, it's good to see you. Uh, good to see you over here. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide here. Uh, Jones, are you going to have two slides, sir, because you're going to have a cast of characters that's so... You don't have to I, read all these. They're just there. For I, I'm not going to even try to name all of these, but I am going to go across some of the more uh, notable ones. Um, we've got the big boy in there who's a very different characterized there in the strip than he was in the movie, famously by Al Pacino. Big boy was loosely based off of uh, Al Capone. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, we've got the Steve the Tramp and uh, Larceny Lou was based off of Ma Barker. Um, you got Boris Arson, who was their play on John Dillinger. You know, I mean, they, they, the colorful cast of characters and villains. And as you can see, as they go on, they just get more and more stylized or grotesque. I think they were referred to as grotesques. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to flip the slide there, Bill, I think there's more. Yes. Um, and here's where I think the show or the strip really gets its stride when they got into like Scardall and like Little Face and, you know, you get to 88 Keys and Prune Face, BB Eyes, The Mole, Flat Top. I mean, you could go on forever. I, I think uh, Dick Tracy's rogues gallery, I would put them up against any superheroes rogues gallery, you know, I mean. I would name only a few who'd have maybe a more impressive rogue gallery. It would be like Batman or Spider-Man. Question, comic book guy. Uh, so who had the first grotesque rogues gallery, Batman or Dick Tracy? Oh, uh, Dick Tracy, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. Do you, think, do you think that may have influenced uh, Bob Kane and uh, his, his, his studio? Uh, who actually wrote the stuff and not Bob Kane to, to come up with these, these grotesque and, and weird characters for Batman. Quite Sounds honestly, like I think these guys borrowed from each other quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, you see a lot of uh, Doc Hump and Penguin, but I mean, there's a Dick Tracy villain called Half and Half, who's a total blatant ripoff of Two-Face. Um, <laughs> You well, know, they, they, they stole from each other quite, you know, just switch the names and move the thing around. I think there's probably like three or four different uh, blank guys he even robbed from himself. He's got the <laughs> blank and then he's got Little Face and then uh, Nothing Johnson and uh, Spotty and, and they're all basically guys with no face. You know, and, I, and, and, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pitch it up there to the number one Bat fan, the Unmasked Maniac, who yeah. is Bat fan on Bat fan. Uh, Batman, uh, uh, 
what do you think about that? I mean, uh, I, do you agree I, I with think, I think, like Joe just said, I think it goes both ways because this was a highly influential st strip that was in a lot of national newspapers that preceded the existence of Batman. But when the grotesque came along, I don't know the exact year and timeline because I'm not an expert on this, but um, I do know that when World War II was going on, you had Hitler, you had Mussolini, and there's a reaction to these over-the-top real-life villains where he's like, he moves away from just doing straight regular gangsters and like, like Superman in the 40s. He's fighting just regular guys, just assholes basically who lived in his neighbourhood. It moves on to being these supervillain types of grotesque, the weird faces and exaggerated proportions. He's trying to compete with what's going on in the real world horrors, these like real life supervillains, because they're getting all the news and attention. He wants people to re read his goddamn newspaper strip. So he's, he's trying to reinvent himself and do different things. And as Joan just says, times change. It goes along. It gets reinvented several times over. But yeah, I, th I think the influence goes both ways. I mean, it's it's known for Batman. There were, you know, Zorro and the Shadow, um, other characters of the area, and the, particularly the film and serial versions definitely influenced just about anybody who did pulp novels, pulp era characters that led into the very first superhero printed comics getting away from the prose material. So there was a whole bunch of influences going around back and back and forth, you know. And uh, Pop Actor says he was pretty sure that Flat Top was based on James Cagney, but I think I'll go with whatever Joneser says because he's my number one Tracy fan right now, I think. Well, I, I wouldn't say he's not based off of James Cagney in a way, you know. I mean, I could see that there. I mean, I'm sure Gould, like Johnny was saying, was borrowing from everything that was hitting pop culture. El Elliot Ness, the real life Elliot Ness, of course. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, like even when he was talking World War II and Nazis and the Germany and whatnot, um, I believe Pruneface was a uh, German operative or whatnot. And uh, the yeah, Brown. Says that in some, the yeah, so they were you know, they were working with that what was there, you know, at the time to make these villains. And George Valentine has a collection of Dick Tracy old time radio programs on tape, and some that's not even on YouTube or available. Wow. So that 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 sounds I love them. very interesting. All right, that got my interest. And moving right along, we got even more characters. Keep on going, Jones, or you're not going. You're not going yet. This Jeff. is where you start getting into some of the really weird stuff, and I think here's where Gould has kind of started to effectively lose his mind. Um, <laughs> you know, like we, because like Bill was saying, he the, he tends to kill these villains off, and then he goes, "Oh no, this guy was real popular," you know. So we don't have Prune Face anymore. So who do we got? Well, we got Wormy. So Wormy is basically <laughs> prune face with worms in his face, you know, yeah. or, you know, the blank's gone. So here we've got uh, nothing, nothing over there with no face, you know, flat top's gone. So now we'll put flat top junior out there. Oh, we don't have the mole. How about the rodent with a rat face? And, you know, you just start getting into these weird, <laughs> weird characters, which it makes it fun. And then oh, I like come up with another one. I like that green face is so stylized. You think, oh, he's weird looking, particularly in the movie. I've met a number of people in real life and give prune face a run for them. It's just an old man with wrinkles. Well, what's funny is he's actually not an old man. He's a young man. I know he's not, but in real life, I've seen people that are more pretty than prune face. Like they played him in the movie as more of an old man yeah. gangster. But in yeah. the comic strip, he was a young man. I think he had some kind of a deformity because of yeah, yeah, yeah. nerve gas or something that sagged his face. Hmm. You know, I, 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 right now I'm thinking about Daffy Duck playing Duck Tracy in the oh, cartoon. That's my favorite. <laughs> Neon Noodle! <laughs> <laughs> And even more characters have shown up on your screen there. Uh, this, 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 I hope this doesn't go on forever, but. Uh, no, they, no, they, 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 there's only three. They, this was from an art show somewhere in the US where someone, some guy who was running art show actually went back and clipped all these to collage all these characters for the first time ever to show them all together. And, and it, it's quite impressive. I mean, I'm sure I'm no like one can, 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 can go. You're going to have to watch the replay of this and, and, and pause your screen. And, and I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to go back back through these slides one more time. I think there's four of them. Yeah. I've seen these pictures before. And these are not just villains. These are also like uh, supporting cast. I think there was B.O. Plenty in there and Diet Smith. 
And yeah, B.O. Plenty was an interesting character. Uh, I don't know if Gravel Gertie was in these or he not. He was in there. Gravel Gertie was in there. And, I'm going to uh, full screen this real quick, and I'm going to slowly move through this so that yeah, people can have a chance to kind of look through these. Uh, and, and, like, if you're watching the replay, you can pause your screen maybe and, and see these. Breathless, breathless yeah, there's B.O. Plenty right there in the center. Right by Itchy. Yeah, I see him. I got um, some B.O. Plenty going on here in the heat in Perth, I'll tell you. I kind of remember him being in uh, the Archie cartoon show as well. And he was very popular, you know, for the supporting cast. I think he starts out as kind of a villain-type character who becomes part of the supporting cast, which was something that happened often in the strip as well. I think a di Vitamin Flintheart or Diet Smith also were that route. Yeah, and uh, Diet Smith, if I'm not mistaken, was the scientist who was responsible for a lot of Dick Tracy's uh, uh, gadgetry. I, I, either that or he was the uh, the money man behind the scientists that did that, mm -hmm. I want to say. But I, I, I'm i not quite there yet. <laughs> and in fact, in the 40s, I'm not quite past the 30s. And then uh, go, going beyond the strip here, Johnny, what do we have here? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just before I read this one, I spotted one of there was called Johnny Score, and that has like half, at least half the letters out of my name. That's all right. Um, Dick Tracy's popularity led to merchandise, including toys, books, and even a radio show in the 1930s. In 1945, a Dick Tracy movie serial was released, followed by several more film adaptations and television series over the years. These, these were the Ralph Bird. Um... Dick Tracy serials. Yeah, I think he was a G man in those, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, the the Ralph Bird ones, and then there was another one. I uh, the guy's name's escaping me, but uh, these these were quite good for the time, you know. But I mean, there were you know like the like if you ever watched the Batman serials or whatnot, they kind of play out like that, you know. Of the Batman serials, to me, I don't know if they were meant to be uh, 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 serious at the time, but they were kind of they're kind of hilarious to watch now. And I think one of them, uh, the the villain is, is a yellow peril Japanese because we we were in the midst of World War II at the yeah, time. It's on the comic covers. And uh, we have a, a a person who's joined us, the Briscoe twelve thirty four, and he says. Uh, hello to everyone, and hello to Briscoe 1234. Glad to have you here with us tonight. And everybody's loving on Duck Tracy. Uh, George Valentine says Duck Tracy was great. However, he's more partial to Duck Dodgers. Uh, so, Duck that's Dodgers. what I meant to say. I, sorry, I wrote Rogers there, Dodgers. <laughs> I was thinking of yeah, they, 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 half century. Yeah, they spoofed, they spoofed on a lot of stuff back in those days Man, in, right. in the cartoons. Uh, let's see what we got on the next slide here. Here we go. Uh, go ahead, Jones. Uh, the Dick Tracy character left a lasting impact on American popular culture, and his name is synonymous with the crime-fighting detective archetype. His appearances extended to various media, including comic books and video games. And, Damn, uh, yeah, that's Dick a giant statue there. That's what that is. Oh, yeah, I was, well, was going to ask about that. Where is, uh, where is that statue, by the way? I don't um, know exactly. I just randomly found it and went, that's really cool, and it's going in there. I'm still trying to work out. They mentioned a town, but you know, you watch like The Simpsons, it's like Springfield. I'm like, yeah, but which state? I'm like, it's, it's some small town in some unknown state. If you look at the bench next to it, that's a human-sized bench where you'd be sitting down. So that's like 9 to 12 feet tall. Mm -hmm. We well, you know E.C. Seeger's got a, a, a Popeye statue in his hometown in Illinois, and also there is a place in Texas that's got a giant Popeye statue because that's where a lot of spinach is grown. So, you know, it, it, it stands to reason. All right, now this is a this is a kind of a, a complicated slide here for you, Joneser. I'm going to bring my screen up big, and I'm going to bring this out this slide out. Uh, hopefully, let me get back down here to to bring this slide out big so folks can read that little bitty writing. And I'll let you. Uh, I think this was actually Johnny's read. I just did the last one. Oh, did you? Okay, it's Johnny's turn. Go ahead, Johnny. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't intend someone to read all this. I just put it in there for facts and figures, you know. But um, Chester sure. Gould continued to write and draw Dick Tracy until his retirement in 1977. Afterward, other artists and writers took over the comic strip keeping the character alive for new generations of readers, not unlike an old Popeye and NC 
Seagar had Sagendorf. Um, he had, you know, apprentices and other people he worked with who took over, and then later on, other people moved on and did more of the thing. But you got Chester Gould, Max Allen Collins, Rick Fletcher, Dick Lockler, Mike Killian, Jim Broseman, Joe Statton, and Mike Curtis, who's the most recent one who's writing it currently in, in this year. Well, who is the who is the current artist on that, Johnny? Uh, the bottom one, Mike, Mike Curtis. Okay, Mike Curtis is drawing that now. So, uh, so what we have, what we have here is we have a strip that is that is continuous and still going today. Is it uh, who who is the uh, syndicator on that? I I don't know because in the old days it was the William Randolph Hearst newspapers. So I don't know. Well, like King, King <laughs> I don't know Fe William Randolph Hearst and King Features Syndicate. Anything else? I'm, I'm, I'm it, close maybe it, it maybe King more. Features. I don't know. Somebody in the chat may know. Uh, we should have done our homework on that one. I was kind of curious about that. Uh, and I hadn't I thought curious. about it, to be honest, because I didn't know it was still going until I looked up references this week. To yeah, it's well, not in it. every paper like it used to be. Yeah. It, it quite no, honestly, it used to be every, and everything. There was a time when Dick Tracy was arguably the most popular fictional character in, in America. Yeah, I mean, people the bought the newspapers to get the comic strips more than the news a lot, a lot of the time back then. Like, you know, you got big full color pages and a lot of real estate in the newspapers, and they started shrinking it down smaller and smaller to where it's hard to even read or see the panels, and it right. really killed off a lot of the strips. Sir Clifton, I believe that that's Max Allen Collins, and yeah, he kind of got an Elton John look about him in that particular picture. <laughs> does. But uh, Max Allen Collins, I, I I remember he did some Dick Tracy, but I hope he did a better job with Dick Tracy than he did with uh, Batman, because he's not a good Batman he, writer. He also created uh, Road to Perdition, which graphic novel, which they turned into a movie, and as a was it went on to be a screenwriter as well for various like TV shows and that. I'm not knocking back Max Allen Collins. I uh, I used to read Miss Tree all the time, and I liked that. Uh, uh, she was a detective, and uh, her name was Tr last name was Tree. I think her first name was Michael, so she was Miss Michael Tree. But it, it was M S dot tree mystery so and it's kind of a <laughs> oh, right. there. uh let's see what the yeah, next, next slide's going to be here yeah well we're we got old max allen collins here on a, uh, a big picture holding the dick tracy in his hand go ahead uh, i guess because he was a successor but also like a historian on the character he still kind of represents it to this day in that capacity um the forward in the dick tracy books is usually max mm -hmm. allen collins yeah um, he's the one i remember reading growing up um a lot of times if i could get the gould stuff it would be in like something like he's holding there where they have like a best of dick tracy um gojitron comes through he tells us it's syndicated by the tribune content agency there we go uh, which I think I've, I've always referred to them as the Tribune Syndicate, but uh, yeah. that, that tells us the answer that we always wanted to know. And Gojitron, folks, is a wealth of knowledge. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. I'm sorry to talk over you guys. Oh, you're fine. I was just saying that uh, like, kind of like what he's got in his hands there in that picture was about all of the stuff that I could get my hands on when I was a young lad was to do, read kind of like a best of or Tracy's best cases or, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And let's get on to the next one here. Uh, we're going to, we're going to have a, uh, a slideshow of Jones's Dick Tracy toys. Tell us what we see here. Well, my son Lyric made some money for a big boy to be holding in his hands. Money, there, and I, money, bought, money. I bought one of those coats off of eBay there because uh, these figures, one of the things that they were really missing, especially if you see them on card, is they don't have those iconic trench coats. And it really exactly. just kind of hurt the toy line, in my opinion. These were produced by Playmates, which of, of Ninja Turtle fame. And they, they pair well with your Ninja Turtle toys. They make good goons for your turtles to beat up. Um, there's Tracy and Sam Ketchum. Lyric made a little wrist radio for Tracy there, which I thought was pretty neat. You know, and we got the two coats off of eBay there. And uh, I I like the fact that they all come with billy clubs so they can beat the shit out of the damn bad guys. 
I'll tell you what, reading the stuff from the 30s, you're almost taken aback by uh how brutal the police I mean, blackjack. Are. Yeah, because they just they they do not care. Like the things like uh you you have the right to remain silent, like they, that yeah, wasn't even a rule. That wasn't yeah, even a rule back then. Like they yeah. just kicked in the door and beat the crap out of you and hit you until you confessed. You know, that was just how it was. And, and OBS agrees that they look way better with their little jackets on. Oh, it's the bow legs. And yeah, uh, well, we'll give them credit. They're easy to stand. Like they're not like yeah, the Well, whole, yes, they are. Like He Man and Turtles, they're, they're doing their squats. They've got some powerful legs there. Right, right. But I mean, it, get a, a vintage He Man figure to stand up is aggravating a lot of times. Yeah. Whereas these ones, <laughs> there's not a lot of problem. Whereas the Turtles, for whatever reason, they gave them those bent toes. Yeah, yeah, they well, gave them the elevate like yeah, yeah, the those ankle ones are kind of a pain, but the ones that are flat footed, I think like Raph mm. and uh, Mikey were easier. Yeah, so, some of the later figures had more of the flat feet, but yeah, they did those weird like um I guess they're trying to do like kung fu ninja poses and shit, like, right? But they, they don't stand up good at all. It looked cool, but they weren't good for yeah. standing. So uh did these figures come with these accessories that they have in their hands? Yeah, and lids and crowbars and looked like yeah. a uh a plunger to blow up some dynamite somewhere. Yep, they came uh, with everything except the Mario. coats. The coats yeah. are added by me. And yeah, I noticed, so I noticed that some characters already have a, a sculpted on jacket, so they didn't need a coat, right? Correct. Yeah, so I left that. But it's cold, Bill. It's Chicago. Come on. Yeah, and it's supposed to be the Windy City, you know. They should be prepared for that. Hey, did you have a theory, Jones, you reckon maybe in the tooling budget they were supposed to come with some better coats or something else? Or? I, I think they had to have because they had to know this looked terrible, you know. I, I, I mean, mean the movie was 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 they were saving money on, uh, by, not, by not putting cloth good jackets on them. And at the yeah. time, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna venture a guess that instead of nice cloth goods, it probably would have been a vinyl jacket of some. Yeah, sort. it would have been a solid plastic for sure, being the company that it was. Well, the blank figure that nobody got had a sculpted on coat. Ah, uh, you know the rest of them did not. So I I don't know. It, it begs the question: is if somebody just dropped the ball on this, or they just went cheap on it, or I don't know. But all I know is. I hated that they didn't have these as a kid, and I have corrected that mistake as an adult. And uh, Briscoe1234 says, these were awesome toys back in the day. I still have Big Boy's getaway car in a box. That is something that I don't think you have yet are the vehicles. There were two vehicles, I think, yep. two or three vehicles in this line. Can you can you expound on that real quick there, Dylan? Yes. There was Tracy's squad car and Big Boy's getaway car. And you can get them fairly affordably. I mean, I think you can get Big Boy's getaway car new in box. It's still for like 100 bucks. In okay. fact, I'd actually say outside of the blank figure, you could probably get this entire line mint on card for under 200 bucks if you shopped around. That, that's surprising because a lot of these, I remember that were sitting on clearance and did not sell well because it was an older adult audience and didn't really connect with kids. But it's on the back of Batman 1989 where they're like, oh, we better crank out these toys. You know, it's a movie line and they probably put too many units out that didn't sell. So usually right. when stuff shelf forms, it's harder to get later on, but they're still cheapish today, you say? No, they are. They're all very easy yeah. to find, very affordable. You can find all oh, of them on card or loose for real cheap. That's good for collectors. <laughs> Right, yeah. If somebody wanted to get in on a line and get the whole thing, and it, with the exception of the blank figure, which that goes for huge money. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us, tell us why that is. We already know, but maybe some viewers may not. Derek Joneser. Well, the thing is, is there's a spoiler um, with the figure. If you've seen the 1990 movie, the identity of the blank is revealed at the end of the movie. Well, Touchstone, Disney, whatever you want to call them. Um, they were very careful to not let the secret get out. So when the toy line was being released ahead of the movie, they went, uh oh, you could remove the blanks mask and you could see the identity of the blank. So they didn't want the secret to be Whoops. spoiled. So they held the figure back. And then later when, the um, cause they were really hoping for that Batman magic and they yeah. wanted that Batman money. And when it didn't come, um, the, the, everything got pulled, and then those 
units got sent to Sears in Canada. And so that's why the blank is such a hard figure to find. Ah. In fact, my mother actually wrote Playmates a letter because <laughs> I had the entirety of the collection and we spent many, many, many of uh, times at Walmart, Kmart, Target, flipping through the pegs, trying to find that blank figure. And then we'd go to, you know, I was in the city of San Diego, so we could hit two Targets and three Walmarts in a day looking for this thing and a couple Kmarts and nobody I talked to could find this thing. And we didn't know at the time they're all yeah. in Canada. Nobody there's, no, there's no internet message boards or Facebook Instagram to be like, by the way, they haven't put it out. You know, the, right. Couldn't know. So she writes them a letter in about six to eight weeks. We actually get a letter back from playing. What? And, yeah. And it said, uh, I wish I would have saved it. You yeah. know, but I mean, I, I, in my disappointment as a child, I think I just threw it away. But uh, mm -hmm. it said something to the effect of, oh, we thank you for your interest. And uh, I think I sent them because um, they had these little tabs you could cut Hello. out, like fingerprints or something. Like, I think they were trying to do like the pizza points like the turtles had where you could send them. away. So I sent them all of them, you know, like, like I just I want a blank figure. And uh, they, they sent us back. You're like, thank you for your interest. And uh you know, for buying the entirety of the letter. Basically, you know, uh, you're not getting one. <laughs> and we didn't uh, release the figure and yada, yada, yada. Thank you. And, you know, that yeah, was it. Yeah, just say one point fingerprint, and it's exactly the size and shape of the pizza point. So I was just looking up a Google Images because I never, haven't seen it. Yeah, I, I, it's funny because I forgot about those pizza points, and I used to save those as a kid. It, what do you, what do you get for them? Because I don't get nothing in New Zealand. Like, so were there mail aways for turtles? Because I've got loads of turtles. I'm clueless if there was mail aways. Did, you know, I can't remember, but I do remember clipping them out and saving them, but I can't think I ever got anything for them. I know yeah. the G.I. Joe's flag points, you can get all kinds of cool crap with those. You can get vehicles. You can get yeah. uh I think I got I think I got a couple of vehicles, you know, it would be sans the figure that came with it uh, in box, but I mean you can get vehicles that you uh, now, Briscoe1234 says, I had my name down in every toy store, and I never got one even here in Canada. Yeah, I want to say there was a, a, something like 900 units, or I don't remember, whatever. There wasn't very many that was out. Now, now, that brings up another point. Now, you you showed off that novelization of the movie. There was a little story behind that. Uh, let's go ahead and tell that real quick before commercial break. Well, I've had this baby since fourth grade fifth grade whenever the movie came out um nice. and uh the, it's that novelization of the movie by max allen collins and quite honestly i've read this thing about a bazillion times it's way better than the movie they're like most books are that has more detail more to story it's expanded upon but one of the things the studio bid on collins about was at the end of the book he could not reveal the identity of the blank because the book was going to be out ahead of the movie. Aww. Well, how do you do this ending where the villains on the ground and they're taking <laughs> off the mask and you can't say who it is. And it's he somehow it pulls right. it off kind of beautifully in a way. But uh, what's funny is uh, later on, and I think there's an interview, I can't remember where I saw it, where, or maybe it's a, I read it, but a Max Allen Collins complaining that, uh, you know, Disney touchstone, whatever you want to call them, scrapped his ending in the book and, and they monkeyed with it too. He had a lot more things he wanted to do. They said he strayed from the screenplay, but uh, there was a coloring book that came out that had the reveal in there. And, and <laughs> he, I guess he mailed it to whatever pencil pushing geek told him that he couldn't do it. And then though this one must have got by yeah, or whatever. Oh, but our coloring books from South America have given it away. <laughs> right, right. And, and yeah, so they had the spoiler was out there, you know, so all us kids that didn't get toy blanks and Kind of yeah, tradition and action figure book. lines of giving away movie spoilers. It still goes on now. Well, we'll talk about the movie here in a minute, but uh, before we do get to the movie, I will put this put this point out to everyone. A lot of people think that the Dick Tracy movie was a failure. It was not. It actually made no, money. Success. Made money. The problem was that Di uh, Disney slash Touchstone wanted it to make Batman money. Yeah, and it didn't make Batman money by a long shot. 
they should have done a sequel back then, and it, it, that well, was going to be the plan. They but they didn't make. Mm. They were going to make a sequel had it made Batman money, but since it right, didn't yeah. make Batman money, they didn't make a sequel. But Pretty. it made money. It did. It was actually the biggest grossing Disney film to date. It beat Roger mm. Rabbit. Um, if, if, they, if it, that was out today and making proportionally what it made back then, the studios will be begging trying to get that kind of money. But right. they just got greedy. Well, and that thing is, too, they pushed the merchandising machine behind it like it was going to be Batman. And that's yeah. where they lost well, Star Wars the or, money. Yeah. That's yeah. where they got overextended. And I think yeah. it put a bad taste in their mouth because they had all those Dick Tracy shirts on clearance. And yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like they didn't get that Batmania, but nothing no. got Batmania. But yeah, Batman was, was another Batman version of the 90s was movie toys and like, you know, Waterworld and stuff like that. Right. That was always on clearance. You'd walk through and kind of laugh at the movie toys. You'd be like, that's what's going to be on clearance six months from now. <laughs> Kind of reminds me of the Eternals. All right, guys, yep. it's, it's time for a commercial break. It's time for us to go see a man about a horse or get some more coffee and all that kind of good stuff. Enjoy these Dick Tracy themed commercials, folks. <laughs> and his men Mumbles, Flattop, Itchy, and Influence have called a meeting with Pruneface to get him to join their mob. Pruneface agrees, and with weapons drawn, they swear to get Dick Tracy once and for all. Suddenly, sirens blare, searchlights fill the room, and the door bursts open. It's Dick Tracy and his right-hand man, Sam Ketchum. Big Boy's gang is finished for now, but can Tracy keep him behind bars? Find out next time. Dick Tracy! From Playmates. Fruit of the Loom knows that inside your little angel lurks a one-man oh, demolition no. derby. Yay. So Fruit of the Loom makes boys' briefs that last, wash after wash after wash, with pre-shrunk cotton fabric and a super strong waistband. That's why more moms buy Fruit of the Loom. How was your day? Uh, pretty quiet. We did America with Fruit of the Loom. Now look for Dick Tracy on Fun Pals, only from Fruit of the Loom. What can you win in McDonald's Dick Tracy game? Nothing, see? We got it all. All the cash, all the food. Nonsense. There's still millions of food and cash prizes waiting to be won. Hey, I got a winner! Dad, hurry and get your share of the loot. Whoa! Captain, the peanut butter crunch for just later biggest day ever. Mm, you're right. You know what that means? Whoa! Peanut butter crunch every morning for a month. Yeah! Peanut butter crunch cereal is part of a balanced breakfast. Calling all kids, calling all kids. The gangsters and other characters from the Dick Tracy movie are on the loose. And you can catch them on these Cap'n Crunch Dick Tracy door hangers. One of four different door hangers in each specially marked box of Cap'n Crunch cereal. Just stand there, let's get to it. Strike a pose, there's nothing to it. But... Madonna, she's turned the music world upside down. She's starring with Warren Beatty in Dick Tracy. She's Breathless Mahoney. If looks could kill, she'd be public enemy number one. Dick Tracy, coming soon to a cinema near you. Extra, extra, Dick Tracy prices at Hungry Jack. You gotta get back to the Jack. Listen up. Here's the lowdown on the Big Dick Tracy Lookalike Costume Contest. Saturday, July 7th at Wanamaker's in the King of Pressure Plaza, first floor mall entrance. Three categories, Dick Tracy, Breathless Mahoney, and Villains. Registration begins at 11 a.m., contest starts at 2. Prizes include soundtracks, t-shirts, movie passes, Wanamaker's gift certificates, and trips to Disney World, care of Carlson City Flights Travel, and Midway Airlines. So get dressed up in your Dick Tracy costumes and come on out. What do you think of that, kid? The sucking egg. Kids. Wow, I was transported back to 1990 right there, Bill. <laughs> That's my goal. But uh, Johnny says I'm breathless, nothing to do with the movie, though. 
yeah, she did release that I'm Breathless novel. And then you watch that MTV clip that I put in there that makes you think that Vogue is going to be part of that uh, 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 album, and it was not. No. <laughs> And uh, I got the uh, the Madonna album so that I could complete my Madonna collection because I was a big Madonna fan back in the day. And I was a little disappointed in that, but I've, I've, I've grown to uh, appreciate it a little more uh, in my older age. I will say that. That's why she went all veiny and weird. <laughs> all right, guys, let's... Uh, let, let, Let's go back to uh, to to our slideshows here. We got uh, the the movie slideshow coming up here. So uh, th this got Warren Beatty in it, who is the the most non Dick Tracy looking non squared jaw guy God. that I know. Could they at least have put some some uh, some some prosthetics on him so that he would have that square jaw? I, I believe there are. I've not seen these, but there were test shots where they did that. And ultimately, mm -hmm. I believe it was decided that um, the title character could not look like the villains did because he they wanted the audience to be relatable to him, mm -hmm. which was probably the right decision. But I also think it was probably also heavily weighed in where Warren Beatty is a very high opinion of Warren Beatty and he didn't want to hide his hands <laughs> in face, you know. I think I think I think that the latter one was probably uh, more correct there, Jones. Or he, he he didn't want to wear that shit on his face because that would obscure his beautiful looks. Correct, correct. But I mean, if you look at Al Pacino, um, he he showed that the makeup would not hamper his acting. Uh, good to see you there, Epic Badger. Glad you could jump on and give us some likes, share it around if you would, sir. Maybe watch the replay when you do get a chance because there's a lot of good stuff on tonight. And uh, OBS says, I know like Beatty. Hmm. He's okay. Uh, I, and he's kind of wrapped up in this Dick Tracy, is he not? Oh, he's obsessed. Hmm. Uh, Pop Actor wants to know how old Warren was in this movie. 50? That's a Google question. <laughs> I want to say he's 80 something now. So he was dating Madonna at the time of maybe, I'm not 40s, maybe 50. I don't know. I want to say 40. Madonna and probably several other girls. No, no he, was, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was, uh, he was linked with Madonna. I mean, she even had him in that, in that awful movie that she made when she was on tour. And uh, I think that may have been one of the reasons why she got uh, cast in this movie, if I'm not mistaken. It, it is, and they needed someone who could sing and do yeah. the part. You know, I also think it kind of hurt the movie in a sense because the love story is supposed to be Dick Tracy and Tess Trueheart, but watch that movie. The love yes. story is Dick Tracy yeah. and Madonna, oh. you know, and... It, it's just I don't know. With an outfit, so you can't blame yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, he 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 was in Truth or Dare. That was that 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 awful thing that she did, and I I, I think she actually uh, kind of uh, emasculated him a little bit in that. Uh, she's good oh, about sure. doing stuff like that. Uh, Warren Beatty was a perfect Dick Tracy, says uh, Sir Clifton. He pulled it off, in my opinion, even though he didn't have the square jaw. I love Warren Beatty, especially his role as Bugsy Siegel. That, that's a good movie, that Bugsy movie. He did really and well in that. He was also in Reds. And uh, the pop actor Rick in the Briscoe 1234 been having a conversation about toy stores in Canada. So... I hope you guys get that all worked out uh, as we move into the Dick Tracy movie here. And uh, the artwork on those uh, was pretty fairly decent, in my opinion. I love the artwork. They, they did several different posters with several different scenes like this right here. Kind of, I guess, trying to evoke the strip a little bit, wouldn't you guys say? Yeah, absolutely. And All then, right, um, here we go. And we'll start with the man who made the slides. <laughs> the man who clicks some buttons and puts some images. <laughs> Makes it sound like I actually did something. The computer doing it. Um, 
But just for I um, get into the cast there, also um, Warren Beatty was actually interested in doing Dick Tracy movie as far back as the mid seventies, um, but it, it was a no go. The rights went up; they couldn't get a hold of them. It went on for many years, back and forth, different studios, different before it eventually settled where it did, and the film got made off the back of um, Batman '89 being very successful and. Studios scrambling, going, what other old pulp characters can we crank out a movie? Quick, let's do The Shadow and Dick Tracy, and what can we do for you know, not too much money? Mm. So that's the background of it. But, yeah, the cast was pretty damn impressive, really. you got Warren Beatty as Dick Tracy, Madonna as Breathless Mahoney, Al Pacino as Big Boy Caprice, a.k.a. Al Capone, uh, Glenn Headley as Tress Twohart, Charlie Cosmo as Kid, Dustin Hoffman as Mumbles, William Forsyth as Flat Top, James Kahn as Spaldoni, and I forget James Kahn's even in this. Uh, Mandy Patel, along. 88 Keys, he, he can see a good tune, that fella, and went on to be on Chicago Hope and other TV shows. I actually saw this back in the cinema and the year it was released with my grandfather, who remembered the newspaper strips from when he was a kid. So it was kind of a cool experience for me. My first experience of Dick Tracy really was getting to see this movie in the cinema, and I did enjoy it. You know, there's a couple others that are, are not noted here. Dick Van Dyke was in the movie as uh, D.A. Uh -huh. Fletcher. Um, oh, what's that lady's name? She was in the weird Stephen King movie where they tied the guy to the bed and broke his leg. Um, oh, that's um, C Kathy Bates? Thank Kathy you. She's Bates. the court stenographer in the movie. Oh, man. I so, didn't know she was in the movie. Tiny, tiny role, but she was she was in the movie. Um yeah, it's a star-studded cast. Even some yeah. of the walk-by characters are, mm -hmm. are full-blown Hollywood royalty. You know, it, the movie was very stylized. Um, it, it, it's just there's nothing like it. You know, it really does invoke a comic book. My my question is, uh, and, and, and of course, I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it to Jones or anyway. Uh, the character of the kid, is that is that Junior? Yeah. Yeah, that's ju uh, Junior. Um, and uh, in, in the strip, he started out as a kid, and then they aged him up a little bit and then married him off. So uh, right. those, of, those of you who may not have realized who that character was, that, that that's the character that ultimately became uh, Junior. Well, and what's amazing is this movie really does kind of follow his origin pretty closely to the strip. I mean, they, they of course do their Hollywood thing where they make it fit their screenplay. But in the original strip, he was originally a ward of Steve the Tramp who was picking pockets and being a bad boy. And Tracy later beats up Steve the Tramp and takes the kid on as his own. Uh, Briscoe1234 says, I wish they'd kept more of the villains from the beginning of the movie. Shoulders, little face, rodent. Well, with an ensemble cast like that, you kind of got to go through them. Well, here's yeah. the problem. Like Johnny was saying, we were going to do a sequel. It almost left nobody alive to do the sequel with. I mean, <laughs> who, the Mumbles and 88 Keys, like who was left? Kind of kind of reminds know? me of uh, what Chester Gould did back in the day in his own yeah. show. I mean, he didn't have anyone left to do the sequel, whereas each one of these villains, even the ones that die in the first five minutes, there were eight weeks to ten weeks of comic strip they got out of each one of them. And yes, uh, uh, there's a bit of chat going on about Madonna here. You know, uh, 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 OBS had said that uh, Warren doesn't do it for her, and Pop Actor said me either, but Madonna does. And then OBS brings up a pretty good point. Madonna was pretty hot back in the day, but she's a haint now, right? Oh, she looks great in this movie. This is about as good as she gets right here. But now she's the grandmother, so, you know, I don't need to see all the gory details now. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> a lot going on in the chat down there. Uh, here we go. Uh, slide number four there, Joneser. Uh, Dick Tracy is a 1990 crime film directed by and starring Warren Beatty as the titular character, Dick Tracy. The film is set in a stylized, colorful 1930s Chicago and follows a detective's quest to take down the ruthless gangster Big Boy Caprice, portrayed by Al Pacino who, in my opinion, steals the show in this well, he's movie. Like every scene he's in. Like, yeah. like Take that, show. Robert De Niro and Untouchables. He ain't nothing. Uh, so it's set in Chicago in this movie. Did the, did the newspaper strip ever put 
a name to his city? As far as I know, they didn't. It was just called like the big city or mm-hmm. like, you know, like I don't think they ever gave it a name. I don't think they do in the movie either. Speaking of cityscapes, uh, I, I know you saw this when you were going through this, uh, Johnny, because uh, I've already looked at these slides and I saw them. There is a uh, a blog out there on Blogspot that That's what I was uh, at. it has beautiful pictures from this movie. And That's I why I might have borrowed from that image from. <laughs> I started to use some of that, but I thought I ah, probably should should be a little a little more uh, copyright. <laughs> Yeah, I, used, I, I used a image from there. I didn't want to pinch too many things from one source, you know, because it was a whole production history, really, of the film and the art side of it. And uh, Briscoe1234 thought Tess was the hotter hotter of the two there. So she's the good girl. Madonna's the bad girl. There you go, Johnny. Oh, yeah. So as Tracy investigates, he encounters a seductive nightclub singer named Breathless Mahoney, played by Madonna becomes both an ally and a romantic interest and despite this being a pg film which in today's landscape would be pj 13 there's a couple of scenes in here which where she's full-on bloody well naked just wearing a little see-through thing and yeah. i didn't realize how much of the um um details in the upper half of the torso region of the female anatomy was clearly visible on the screen and because oh, i'm absolutely. looking at it close up on my monitor doing the stills for this i went you would not get away with that in today's cinema landscape. That would be like a 16 at least. Right. Yeah, it was getting a Let me see here. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to guess what, what she's saying in this scene here. It's a little cold in here. My knees <laughs> are getting a little, a little hard here. <laughs> no, this movie would never have gotten a PG thirteen or PG rating in today's no, land. No, no, no. Just and, the gunplay and, alone would have eliminated it. Well, one of the reasons it was released by Touchstone and not Disney itself is because Disney made Touchstone so they could release movies like this and not tarnish the Disney name. Although uh, they they don't give a shit nowadays, it doesn't seem like. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, going on there, Jones. Here you go. Film features an array of unique and memorable with their own memorable villains. I didn't see it under that live streaming with their own distinctive yeah, traits and eccentricities. And uh, I really got to say, I love the look on the face of the guy playing shoulders in this scene. It is such a shame that we did not get more out of these characters in this movie because these guys are I mean, spoiler alert for a 30 year old movie. These guys were wiped out, like, I think in the first five, 10 minutes of the movie. Oh, yeah. 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 The machine guns everywhere. Uh, just, uh, it, 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 uh, I remember going to see this in the cinema when I was a young man uh, of 19 or 20 years old. And I was blown away by the fact that they killed off just about half the cast right at the fucking beginning of the movie. Right. Well, and if you read Max Allen Collins' novelization, they expand on this scene a little more, and you get a little more out of them, but not much. But one thing that they were trying to do here in the original script was they were playing off of the uh, um, St. Valentine's Day Massacre mm-hmm. is what the idea was. And uh, the, in, the, in the book, they called it the 7th Street Garage Massacre. There you go. Okay. And, uh, so they were they were trying to get that rub with the real history there, but the problem was I mean these were some iconic villains that just didn't get much for screen time, especially Stooge Viller. He was a huge part of the original strip, you know, and they all got or three of them got an action figure release anyway, even though they're barely in the movie. There you they go. Some great suits. Full props to the costuming department. <laughs> there you go, Johnny. Dick Tracy is known for its visually striking art direction, which pays homage to the comic strip's bold and vivid imagery, which is your film noir, your gangsters and weird hideouts on the waterfront and old abandoned warehouses. So I put the text down the bottom here so we can get a good look at these guys sitting around. They've got a bit of hooch going on, maybe some gambling while they're waiting for their next job. Well, in, yeah, for- in the novelization, right before the guys burst in with the machine guns and take these dudes out they draw the um 
the dreaded aces and eights, the dead man's hand. Oh, it's bad luck, you know? And so they played that whole shtick out in the book, which is great, you know? I get the feeling like Batman's going to burst in through the skylight and just kick him in the head. Tracy does that skylight move in the movie. <laughs> Mm. Uh, now you say uh, talking about the the art direction here, paying homage to the strips, bold, vivid imagery. I'm going to go with Jones on th this question here. Uh, do you agree with that? And 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 expound upon that a little bit, please, sir. Well, I I do think that they uh, go with the strips imagery in the sense of the violence for sure. But the strip was mostly in black and white. This movie is very yeah. colorful. But the mm -hmm. one thing that was really cool, what uh, Warren had talked about this, every green is the shade, same shade of green. Every red is the same shade of red. That's the same red hat. That's the same red table. That's the same red hat on the kid. That's the same red on Big four Boy. Four colors. Yeah, four, four colors. We remember four color comics. Uh, I, 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 I agree that I think they were trying to evoke a comic strip thought in your brain as you watch this movie it was trying to be a live action comic strip on screen Absolutely. um that reminds me of something i'm, I'm kind of getting off track here and, and i may have to upload this and show it to you guys did you know that william dozer the old bill dozer of batman fame and green hornet fame wanted to do a dick tracy television show going so far as to create opening and closing credits for it I'm sorry, I was reading the chat there. Was that a question, Bill? I, was I had not heard, of, heard about that, like in filming of Batman 66, but no, I, I know about... Did, uh, John, I, Green Hornet curious, going, but like, I didn't know about the Dick Tracy possible show. Did you know that, that William Dozer of Batman and Green Hornet fame was going to try to do a Dick Tracy television show in the vein of Batman? Have you yeah, seen... I, I seen the, um, the pilot that never saw the light of day. I think you can see it on YouTube. I saw the opening and closing credits for it. It kind of had an interesting theme to it. Dick Tracy, yeah, he's, he's a good cop. The whole style of what they did in Batman 66, I feel like that would have worked even better for a Dick Tracy because they took um, – that was an excellent show, great cast, great production values, yada, yada, yada. It was riffing on – I, I may have to show that tonight. Comment. I did not upload it to, to, uh, to, to, to StreamYard, but I may have to show that because – the, yeah. I, I like the opening of it because it started with it. It, it would it like kind of like Batman. They would show the the comic strip version, and it would morph into the character that was going to play that character in the in the show. Uh, other than the theme song, which is kind of weird, but uh, it was pretty good. I thought, and I agree with the point Johnny was starting to make there that it, the colored stylized thing it would have blended well it would have done well I don't know if they would have got away with the gunplay or the violence or any of that in television yeah they definitely would have made it campy but like the the colors to me when I see this film it's 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 the Sunday strips because your weekdays are black and white the Sunday's got all the color in there oh uh, yeah the, the well the back in those days people may not know this now back in those days a good comic strip like say uh tarzan or 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 uh flash gordon uh dick tracy they would have a popeye they would have a full page in the sundays uh, uh funnies and people would flip to that damn page like you look at the front page headline as you're walking through the checkout of the supermarket people would pick up newspapers sometimes just for a sunday strip yeah, the, the sunday comics were thick and they in each strip except for the, the smaller ones, which which will be a half page. Most of them filled up a whole page. Now, some of them had a topper on them, but... Yeah. Uh, it, it, some it of the topper fun. or the underneath were built by the same artist or person. It would kind of like be a different thing and complement it. And... and I forget who's next. I think it's... Jones. Up. up yeah. you go, Jones. The film blends elements of action, crime, drama, and a touch of film noir while staying true to the spirit of the original comic strip. I, be I believe we just expanded on that ourselves, mm -hmm. but I mean, look at that background. I mean, you almost can't oh, that's tell nice where, painting. you know, yeah, you can't tell where the painting begins and ends and where the real life, I mean, it's just blended together so well. Mm -hmm. Blends into the set, not unlike the um, Burton and Anton first Batman 89, very similar sort of thing. I've got somebody down here that wants some attention. Hello, cat. 
That's always want attention. All this attention, so you'll go away. See, the hello they everybody. The house and everything in it. They kept asking me to pull out my dick. Now Bill's going to pull out his pussy. Oh, oh, God. It's all happening on this side. <laughs> <laughs> He, he's, he, he came in, he came in here and he comes up to the to, to the chair and he's sitting there you know pawing at me like this right oh. here <laughs> and of course I pick him up and rub on him a little bit and that's enough he he, he he's out of the room now he's gone <laughs> if I pick yeah. our cat up he gets annoyed he doesn't like being picked up he just wants to walk under my feet and then circle around and out of the room again <laughs> I figured you guys were, were, were playing with each other with quotes, but no, nah, they're having an East Coast, West Coast Canadian rap battle toy wars. With, no, go. I, I got them doing quotes from my good fellas, man. <laughs> I was watching it for a second. I was like, oh boy, what are we doing? Oh, here? Fun. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I didn't realize what was going on until I started actually reading. I was just seeing the wordy dirds. Well, and right when you it, asked me the question, I was uh, the, our overlord censors there. Uh, right when you asked me the question, I was reading it and I like missed your question. <laughs> I was trying to process what was happening there. Bill never saw the Goodfellas movie. That proves it. No, I actually do remember watching that movie. I just don't remember anything about it. And uh, OBS wanted to know the name of the kitty cat. His name is Roscoe. Roscoe P. Kitty Cat. You gotta say Rusko like that. Mike Fee in the house. Hey Mike, what's going on, man? And Johnny Swanson laughing his ass off. All right, so I'm just enjoying the f bombs from <laughs> the chat. Well, I, I, I like how they're getting around the censorship there with the uh, uh, just, making just the, the yeah yeah and you mother flippers. Here here we go, Johnny Swanson. Okay. Dick Tracy, the movie, like you don't know what we're talking about by this point, received critical acclaim from its performances, production design, and makeup effects, earning several Academy Award nominations, winning Oscars for Best Art Direction and Best Makeup. And this is another background like painting thing they would use for like your matte shots where they combine background, foreground stuff. And they did do some amazing, big, large-scale paintings for this film. The opening credits, the cityscape, like, Go out and take a look at the side of the wall of your house. That's how big some of these paintings were. They're absolutely massive. Because I saw like still shots behind the scenes of um, uh, production people working on it. And they're like little ants in front of this giant, massive painting. And then they've brought the cameras into these close-ups on these amazing paintings. And uh, I'm going to try to upload something real quick. So let me do this. Oh, he's uploading more time. of these dick pics. Uh, yes. Uh, there we go. I'll let you guys expound on this while I try to get this upload started. Well, the film makes effective use of the many met, Matt Matei shots. Is that how you say that? Yeah. Matt. Matt shots combining Uncle large travel and Matt. painstakingly, I'm going to assume that says, detailed backgrounds, paintings, and foreground imagery and actors. And uh, yeah, like uh, there's some of that scenery that Johnny was talking about there. Was, you can see the scope of it. Um, when was the last time you guys watched this movie? God, Lord. Uh, I want to say probably more than 10 years ago. I watched it probably about 10 years ago, but I've seen everything that's technically in it on my screen in the last 48 hours up close from the bug eyes. I've been. Uh, in the Dick Tracy rabbit hole for the last couple of months, I have watched this probably a zillion times when I was a kid and all the way up into my adult life. And I think I've just watched it two or three times in the last two months. And I'd have to say of Blu-ray this week, so I'll be watching it again. Well, and I'd have to say that and I may be seeing this through nostalgia goggles or whatnot, but I do believe that it holds up. To this day, it's still. Oh, just I've as always good felt that it, way. Like I felt that way in 2000, 2010, and now I think it holds up as a decent film. I'm just going through the chat here. Uh, it does hold up as a very decent film. As a matter of fact, I think I have it on DVD in the in the collection in there. I would have to go through the collection to find it. 
but uh, it makes me want to watch it again. You know, I think I, I have it on DVD, but I bought the Blu-ray because it was ten bucks. I'm like, I want to watch it again on my TV. Yeah, I'm, I'm, just, well, like, I need to I, buy the Blu-ray. I have the original DVD when they first started selling DVDs of it. I bought one, and I still have it. But yeah, I'm gonna have to get a Blu-ray version because I remember um, there the behind the scenes or the making of is almost just as interesting as the movie itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love practical effects all day long, man. So it's still of that era when they were doing a lot of practical effects. So even your B-grade films are back then still kick the ass a lot of the films they're putting out today. Well, in today's landscape with the comic superheroes really dominating the box offices, I really think this movie probably would have done better nowadays than it did then. Yeah, it probably would have. Like, it's a shame that um, old bloody Warren Beatty's been a real squatter on the rights and prevented an actual sequel coming out. If they'd done a sequel back then, maybe it would have moved on and we could have had a modern update. And by which I mean update, more for like a Batman Begins or a Year One sort of Dick Tracy, not an actual fucking multicultural bullshit update. I thought they do everything now. Right. Well, and I think a lot of the problem with Dick Tracy is it, it, it kind of hits me like the Fantastic Four, the farther you take them out of the, the 60s, 60s, the more right. they don't fit. And it's the same yeah, with Just Tracy. making the fucking 60s. They make period films all the time, the bloody right. old time London and the Civil Wars. Just make it the era it works in. It's not modernizing right. shit. That don't yeah. need to be modernized. I think he needs to stay in the 30s or the 40s yeah. and, and not move from there. For sure. Can you imagine Dick Tracy today? Not the newspaper strip, but a movie. It, it would be awful if they tried to set it a... No, no, I don't. I don't think. I don't think. I don't think space coops and moon maids would work very no. well in a Dick yeah, Tracy movie. Cartoons, maybe. I don't know. But uh, well, they tried. Many of the, the guys that came up with that redacted at some point. Went no, we'll go back to what worked before. <laughs> right. Well, they did, but uh, I think Dick Locklear kind of, kind of referenced all of that that it did happen it's just we're not talking about it anymore yeah right. we they kept some the of the technology in the 50 60s but then we kind of moved on from that and and yeah well we talked about that earlier obs uh they were going to uh but but because it didn't make batman money it was a failure in their mind i guess but I mean, and who would have been the villain in the sequel? I mean, who'd they have left? Could they have dug out Scardall or Moodles or BBIs and uh, the Mole? I mean, like, th th there weren't a lot of people left. I mean, granted, he had that giant list of uh, characters to draw from, but he really kind of took the best of and killed them off already. In well, the he took the, he took the ones that were in the in the popular mind of the right. of, of, of everyone. Uh, and of course, uh, this slide here, uh, it, it filmed at Universal Studios and Danny Elfman composed the score. Well, I, Danny Elfman was doing a lot of work in those days, but, uh, you know, he, he kind of scored that Batman movie score. So we got to get Danny Elfman to do everything yep. now. Flash TV. Yeah, show Flash TV. Fire. And, uh, let's see, uh. Everybody in the in the chat here, they, they can't make anything today. It will be total crap. Well, that that's true. Everything they make now is a derivative of something that's already been done. Uh, uh, I don't know which one of you guys want to do this slide here, but here we go. I don't know who's going. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Johnny. Okay. Uh, Beatty had a concept for Dick Tracy film in 1975 but it's not able to acquire the rights until 1985, which actually reminds me of Michael Uslan, who was the producer on basically every Batman film in existence, but you won't know about it unless you read the credits or read um, the awesome book he put out about the um, whole history of him trying to get the Batman film off the ground. Michael Uslan tried to do the Batman film way back in 1980, and but nobody wanted to know about it. Same thing with Dick Tracy, like the cinema... Uh, landscape changed, money, deals, studios, who eventually ideas got shopped around for many years. You're talking a decade worth of shopping ideas around before this got made. Mm -hmm. Kind of like our He-Man movie that's been in development hell for 30 years. Yeah. That ain't I made made I think <laughs> that's, every couple of years on social media, it's like, they're making a He-Man. I was like, no, they're not. You're just, you're just trying to get clickbait. And I clicked. 
<laughs> yeah, oh, I know you did. It's in your username. You click on everything. <laughs> Here you go, Jonzo. You can talk a lot about this one. Uh, Baby still retains the film rights to this day and has appeared in strange online Dick Tasty shorts in order to keep the rights. And I have watched those, and they are weird. I feel for you, sir. I feel for you. I have watched those. And actually, quite honestly, the first one's actually somewhat entertaining, especially if you've got a big nostalgia bug for this like I do. Mm. And uh, the one thing I'll say for Warren Beatty is I think he has fallen into the same Chester Gould trap with Dick Tracy, and he has lost his damn mind. Mm. Well, I think <laughs> yeah. he's got split personality, and one of them is Dick Tracy. And one of them, they do a conference call where uh, Warren Beatty is on one screen and he's talking to Dick Tracy on the other screen. And then there's uh, two other guys interviewing the two of them because they're having a problem where Warren doesn't want to work with Dick Tracy anymore on the new movie. And it, it, it's just wild. Here's the thing, Briscoe 1234. It is hard to make a He-Man movie. Go ahead. Tell us, Jones, what a He-Man movie should have in it. They should have a giant muscle man riding a green tiger fighting a skeleton wizard over a castle. How hard is CG that? Target it's, now. It just seems to be, it seems to be beyond the, the, the ability of people to realize that all you have to do is get back to the basics and you can make a movie that we would all go and see. Yep. Giant muscle man riding a green tiger fighting a skeleton wizard over a castle. That is the movie. Uh, at least Cannon Films never got their hands on Dick Tracy, Good Grief, Charlie Brown. Uh, yeah, uh, at least Warren Beatty has kept this thing close to his heart because uh, I don't know what would happen to it if he didn't keep it. So I'll give him that. Right. Well, well, and he, he mentions in one of those weird things, he mentions wanting to collaborate with somebody or feeling the interest out. And I'm sure he's not wanting to give it away for free or nothing. But I do think that he could be convinced if someone was to give it the same uh, reverence that he's given it. Yeah, but see, the problem is, and I know Warren Beatty quite well in that regard, if he did do another Dick Tracy movie, he would be Dick Tracy in that movie. I think he's kind of learned. He's 80-something years old now. He can't do that. But I do I think know, he might. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, I do think that he might be in it in some shape. I, I love it if he was in it as another character and they got someone new to be Dick Tracy. That'll be right. Fine. That that would be the way to do it. Like he could be the chief of police, or he could be the. Uh, you know, it would be a great handoff. Is uh, and they didn't mention this in the movie, but the motivation for Dick Tracy to want to take down Big Boy was that he and his goons had shot Emil Trueheart, which was Tess Trueheart's father. That's mm -hmm. the story in the strip, and that was the story in the Max Allen Collins novelization. And it's not even mentioned in the movie. I think it got on the cutting room floor, that mm -hmm. whole plot point of it's really revenge. And what would be great is if Warren Beatty played Emil Trueheart, and in the first scene of the movie, he gets plugged. <laughs> that would be nice. It would be a great handoff. What are we looking at here, Johnny? Um, Just a whole lot of us. That's nothing yeah. else, so much else to say. Best scene in the movie. Are you kidding me? Watch this movie back. This is the best scene in the movie. It's Al Pacino dancing terribly, singing terribly, working these girls. It's my favorite scene in the movie. You know, um, Al Pacino is just stealing this here. You know, he just comes out and he's singing the song. He's doing the dance. Get an actor out there and tell him you need to sing bad and dance bad. <laughs> he nails it. <laughs> Uh, here we go. Like. Here we go. Sir Clifton has, has, has chimed in here. Joneser, if Sly Stallone can still be Ricky Rambo and Barney Ross, I assure you, Warren well, Beatty. You're not wrong as far as like production. What can we hide on screen? Cinema celluloid stuff. But Stallone has been a hardcore fitness enthusiast since his twenties. He's been through multiple surgeries, injuries, other stuff. He did a crazy amount of real-life stunts on Rambo and got permanent injuries from that and the Expendables. And so he's got some conditioning, not unlike a fucking macho man or someone who's just a little bit unhinged and is like, fuck it, I'll do it myself. Whereas Harrison Ford got injured on goddamn elephants all the way back decades ago now, Indiana Jones in a back injury and shouldn't have been doing no kind of stunts for nothing ever again. 
size. <laughs> well, didn't he even staple the Indiana Jones hat to his head for a scene? I don't know. <laughs> I, I've heard a... that, that the hat kept falling off when it shouldn't fall off, and he fucking yeah. stapled it to his head. Uh, Prisco1234, I'm going to pitch this one at the man with Motu in his name. I would want he, the He-Man movie to be dark and R-rated, but that's just me. If you're trying to market it to its audience that it had back then, absolutely, because we're all grown up, right? But, I mean, I've seen DC Comics where He-Man's got blood on his sword, and I didn't like it. Mm. Uh, the 80s sorcery dark style of it, He-Man, the, the He-Man I would want to see, says Pop Actor Rick. Yeah, if they did more like mini comic style, I think that would be a good film. I think that's the ticket, is a little bit of a darker tone, but not so dark. Um, like Lord of the Rings, but maybe just not as bloody. And uh, uh, Softy wanted to know uh, how old the, the Stallone is, and everybody told her that he's 77. So, yeah, he's pushing 80, uh, and uh, he looks it, too. He's looking pretty pretty, pretty ragged these days. Oh, well, uh, Stallone fight cave trolls any day. And that brings us to the end of the slideshow mm -hmm. for tonight. Uh, painting there. You did an excellent job there, Johnny. I appreciate everything. Uh, I definitely pushed some buttons on the computer and it made things appear. So that nice. much I can agree. <laughs> you, you did really well, Johnny. And I, I, I want to thank both of you. I've met real life actual artists like one of my old mates who could draw and like he could do sketches, charcoal, paintings. He could build shit with his hands and sculpt. I'm like, I just sit here and push buttons, man. <laughs> what would you use, Canva? Yeah, just Canva. Oh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm like the bootleg that. version of the Jim Lago show. That's that's what you get. Yeah, I, no, I've been playing with Canva myself, and uh, yeah, I like how easy it is to use and how user friendly it is. But it, it definitely is. Like I did learn uh, PowerPoint back in whatever the first version was in the mid '90s in high school. So I did actually learn that program way back then, but not used it ever since. Canva is like a fancy version of PowerPoint with other shit thrown on top, and like anything I do, it's like built on the back of like Grindhead Jim, Weird Late Night Bill, Joneser, um, and of course Jim Largo. I'm like the bootleg version of what, what you guys are doing. I'm just like, oh, no, no, I'm no. You guys, I'm just you like, copy what are you doing? Don't copy sell yourself copy short, copy. short, Johnny Soren. You're selling yourself short. I was watching you and Boba earlier, and yeah. I was digging that uh, wrestle talk you guys yeah. were doing there. I saw, like, I saw a little wrestle. bit of that as I was trying to work on this. Yeah, I saw a little bit of that earlier as I was trying to work on this show. I spent a lot of my time working on this show in the afternoon after I get off work, and I did have to work today, guys. Um, I thought I would show this. That's what I was trying to download uh, and, and uh, actually upload up here so you can see this. I'm going to show this, and and, uh, and we'll talk about it a little bit after I show this. So check this out, folks. Was that the proposal for like a like they were going to do a potential show? Yeah, yeah. that was the pilot. 
uh, they cool. were it got rejected, but that music there you can almost hear the Batman riff in the guitar. Yeah. The well, <laughs> here's something that I can't unhear because I, I I watched a YouTube video about this on all your favorite television shows, even your favorite movies. If you listen to the theme song of the movie, all it is is the title being played on on an instrument. Superman. And you can hear it. So, you know, Dick Tracy, he's a good cop. And you hear, dun, 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 dun. you know, and, and, and there, there you have it. That, that's how it works. So any any TV show that you watch now, when you listen to the theme song of it, you're going to hear the title in it every time you hear it. You can't unhear this now, folks. Hey, I'm not beauty for tomorrow. Mason. <laughs> that was great, my brain. Uh, the lyrics need a little work. I, I told y'all that. That's in like the a beginning. placeholder, though. But the Ventures did that. You could tell by the the the, the sound of it that it had that Venture sound. Johnny digs the music. Uh, well, and even the ending title card there that almost like had the Gotham City bat signal in the sky. Only instead, it was a police car pointing the headlight. You know, yeah, same idea. Well, yeah. You know, you could tell who's producing it and who's behind it. You know, this is the Batman people, you know, and it, it, maybe it would have been good. It's hard to say it didn't get made. You know, they, they have a pilot. You can watch it. I've watched it. It's okay. For so reason. there's, there's, there's more to it than just the opening and closing. Yeah. There, you can see the failed pilot, or I guess you, you, they filmed the pilot and it didn't get bought. It didn't sell the show. So they never made any more. And was the show never place. aired. Okay. But you can see it on YouTube. So I'm going to have to find that and watch it. Is it worth watching? It, it's okay. It makes you wonder what could have been. You know, it's got to be better like, than the Wonder Woman pilot. Yeah. And, oh, the Wonder Woman pilot, pilot took buttholes. Yeah. And, and, and of course, I'm glad that that was not what they made. I'm glad they made Linda Carter and all that good stuff. I think yeah, there's a oh, Doctor show. Strange <laughs> pilot out there too that's. Weird. Oh, they did. They did. Doctor Strange, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it that's, it's the same idea as that. It's a, it's a failed pilot that didn't sell the show. Mm, it's mumbles. Okay. Yeah, I got the time machine turned on, man. I, I know these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we've got about an hour thirty nine into it, and I, I think we about reached the end of what we've got, yeah. unless we want some more to talk about. And I can't think of anything. And I'm hearing something right now in the background that tells me it's almost show ending time. Uh, I will say this: this is Weird Fantastic Toy Adventure. We are on Instagram under Weird Fantastic Toys, and that is where I'm the most active. I do have a Facebook page. Uh, it me active i have a twitter that's not active at all um, and of course the youtube channel and uh i invite you all to join me on any one of those uh, i will answer you on instagram uh go ahead uh, on mass maniac tell us about yourself and your channel real quick uh, i make a whole bunch of nonsense videos sometimes ninja turtles sometimes batman sometimes wrestling if you like any of those things check it out if you don't like those things watch something else you enjoy more there you go. I'm Joneser. I do uh, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, or X, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'm mostly on Instagram. I like to also want to check. Um, Masters of the Universe, Dick Tracy, Ninja Turtles, uh, Phasmophobia, lots of nonsense. Absolutely. And uh, when we come to the end of the show, I need to let everybody know. Uh, I'm not going to be here tomorrow for a hangout. I've got a, a previous engagement. I'll put, a, I'll put a note in the community tab probably in the morning to remind everyone of that. Uh, I know that uh, you get the community tab feeds on your phone, but you don't get them on the computer. Uh, the best way to do community tabs is to go to it when you go to my channel. Go to my channel and go to it. And, and see what I got to say on there. I might post something over on Instagram as well. Uh, we've got a contest coming up. There's a video out there to tell you how to enter the contest. I suggest you watch it. I was going to play it tonight, but I think we kind of ran out of time. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Uh, 
And until next week, everyone have a good journey. Special thanks to the channel supporters. Without your help, these adventures would not be possible. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed today's adventure, please hit like, subscribe, and share the video.